Hey, you just have to drop in one of the most amazing sermons on the net today. Welcome to CNBC. Get ready to have your spirit uplifted and prepare to dive into God's Word. Enjoy today's broadcast. You've got your Bibles. I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. It'll come up there on the scripture here in, uh, in a minute. But 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9. Something that we need to consider as we get into 2023. That if you buy cars, buy them in the odd-numbered years. You know why? Because they come out with their newest models and all of the innovations in the even years, and everything goes wrong with them. So it gives them a year to get it all straightened out. Well, we're in an odd year. Maybe it'll be better than what it was last year. You know, we can all only hope and we can only pray that it will be that way. But in 1 Corinthians 9, or 16, excuse me, verse 9, it tells us of the prospectiveness that we can look forward to if we will but think about what God can do. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 9 says this, For a great and effective door has opened to me, and there are many adversaries. Let's think about that. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you give us encouragement and challenge us at the same time. That you know exactly what the future is, even though we don't. But we know that if we depend upon you, that we will see great things happen for your cause this year. We just ask your blessings upon your word as it goes out. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, something new. If you open your bulletin, you will find an outline of my sermon. There's blank spaces in there. We're going to fill those blanks as we go along. And the reason I'm doing that is to get you more connected in the word of God as we go through it on Sunday mornings. I've had a couple of requests, and so I had Greg about making sure we had all the scriptures that were included in our messages printed out. We scared Kelly to death. I think you've got a line of scriptures there you can't figure out what in the world to do with. Hang on, I'll show you. Okay? (laughs) So we're going to try something new this year. If you look at your outline, we're going to start out with some things. You know, the new year presents many opportunities. That's what this scripture says. It is a time to evaluate our performance in the previous year. No one can be satisfied without knowing and having Christ in their life, though. All phases of Christ's life are a source of joy for the Christian. First of all, his birth, which we just celebrated a week or so ago. The promised Messiah came. His life, he healed and helped. If you read through the scripture, there wasn't a time that Jesus met people that something didn't happen great. They healed them, he helped them, he gave them encouragement. Jesus is needed for that today, especially in our culture and world today. His death, he paid for all man's sins. We'll celebrate that in April this year of Easter. His resurrection, he overcame death. That's something for us to think about. This is part of his Christology about him that he overcame death, and because of that, we have eternal life. His resurrection and his ascension. His ascension, he promised to return for his people. By the way, I'll give you a little footnote, something I've been reading, coming, coming from a book called The Last Nephilim. The cloud that Jesus ascended into was not a normal cloud, folks. It wasn't this misty kind of thing that we see come down and bring rain to us. It was the Shekinah glory of God. And his Bible tells us, and the angel told us that day, that as you see Jesus going away, so shall he descend in the Shekinah glory. And if you go over in Thessalonians, the great promise that's given there is that he's going to come on that same cloud and call us to him before the tribulation. See, there's a lot of things going on in the Scripture sometimes that we miss. And we try to relate it to our day, but we've got to realize 
it won't relate because we're talking about a totally different dimension when we talk about where Jesus is at. To be happy is very simple. We have Christ and you have happiness. So how does Christ bring us happiness? All right, get your outline yet. First one there, happiness through fellowship. God gives us happiness through fellowship. First John 1, 7, I think is one of the scriptures that is there. Y'all find it? But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Notice that fellowship keeps us clean from sin. How does that happen? How does fellowshipping with one another keep us clean from sin? Because we work off of each other. We encourage each other. The Bible says literally for us to, when we see a brother of ours in sin, to go put our arm around them and say, let me help you along the way here, fella, away from that sin and towards Christ. Rather than pointing our finger, we need to be putting our arm around their shoulder because that's what fellowshipping is all about. And it helps us to keep clean. When we buffet against each other, it causes us all to feel the guilt of our sin and to realize that Jesus Christ can forgive it. And it gives us encouragement that somebody else is right there along with us. We are all in the same boat, folks. And we all experience almost the same things. We just react to it differently. And so if we can react together, opposed to sin, then we help each other. Our fellowship is important. Somebody asked me, well, why should I come to church? I said, two reasons. Number one, the fellowship is absolutely important to church growth and to spiritual growth. And number two, not coming to church, you're slapping Jesus Christ in the face because you're rejecting his bride. You ever think about that? The church is the bride of Christ. And I don't know about you, but if you, do, you rejected my bride, we'd have some words. And I'm sure Jesus would have some words with you. That's why we need to be in church, to honor Christ and his bride and to be part of the fellowship. Now, I know COVID has given us, thrown us a, a loop, but folks, it's going to be with us for a long time like the flu. Come, be a part, get sick, stay home, watch on the TV. Come after you get over it, okay? Don't stop coming because you've been sick about four or five days. Get over it, come back, be in the fellowship. We need to fellowship with Christ there. B, we need to fellowship with Christians. Psalms 133, 1 through 3 says, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. What brings unity to a church? It's associating with each other. Sharing common ideas. Encouraging one another. Giving strength through scripture that you've learned. You know, this last year, uh, we have been in doing a lot of reading. And it's amazing the things that I have found. And some of them are going to come back into some sermons later on this, this year as I process some of this stuff. But one other thing that I have learned most from my reading is this. God's got it. It doesn't matter what happens in this world, what we see happening overseas or whatever we see going on in other places. God's got it. He gave us a promise. And Tom, I'm not sure whether or not we're in that rapture, we're going to stand there and watch for three and a half or four or seven years. I don't know. We're, Tom and I are discussing this. We found some scriptures in different translations that kind of make us challenged about what we're going to be doing when Christ resurrects us, those that are dead, and us, which are alive, as Thessalonians says, and takes us to meet him in the air. Where are we going to be for the next seven years? We don't know, but we will be with Christ. Wherever we're going to be, we're going to be with Christ. And he may be using us to do things during the tribulation. I've often thought it would be a good thing for us, some of us seniors that go to home to the Lord or during that rapture time, to be prepared to go back and talk to our grandchildren. Scare the dickens out of them, appear right in front of them, you know. You wouldn't listen before, now listen now. There's some opportunities there. Fellowship through the church, number C.
Church attendance is important, especially as the coming Christ of Christ draws near. Hebrews 10, 25, it says this. All right, let's go to the second point then, happiness through fighting. That's different. Happiness through fighting. The Christian faces a battle every day. Ephesians 6, 12 through 18 tells us that. It says, for we do not wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. In one of my reading on this last Nephilim, it's become interesting, Tom. I found out that basically that group that comes out of the abyss, it's the fallen angels dressed up differently that come out to torment men for five months. They are unchained for five months. And I'll reveal to you one day why that five months is important. Not right now, though. That's another sermon. We are going to be in a battle. We must go forward and fight against the powers of the devil. He's going to be around until the end of time when God finally sets him and throws him into the lake of fire. We're going to be in a battle, Christians. Just get ready for it. First of all, number A, we need to fight sin. In 1 Timothy, it tells us that. Verses, chapter 4, verse 1 through 3. Now, the Spirit expressly says that in latter day times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. A good friend of ours, a lot of y'all know uh, Rick Smith. Rick has written three books, I think, on the doctrine of demons. And uh, I'm on his board, and, and I've been able to get a copy of each one of them. And it's very interesting, the perception of what's going on today. Demonic things are happening, but the reason we don't see them is that we have become so desensitized to his presence in our culture. There are demons out there. They are perverting people. They are destroying lives. And you and I need to be ready to fight against them. Since there will be sin in the new year, which we must fight. Since Satan knows his time is short, he will fight against us, seeking to destroy us. The next thing that we're going to need to fight is slackness. That's B. Fight slackness. Matthew 24 tells us there in verse 12, And because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. We're seeing this across our culture. We're seeing people that have just turned cold against the religious world, against Christianity. They don't want to hear it. I don't know how many people you've talked to, but I've talked to several this year, and it just seems like there is just, I don't want to be bothered with that stuff. I've got more important things to think about. I told one of them the other day, I said, you know what's more important? Whether you're going to live here in heaven or live there in hell, you better make a decision. There's only two places that we go when we die, heaven or hell. And you make the decision here. I was watching a little snatch of a film that I'm going to get for us to see. And there was one, one of the kids that was talking to this guy trying to witness to him who was a teacher. Uh, he said, well, I'll take care of that later. And he said, there won't be any chance to take care of that later. There is no later after you die. It's done. We need to fight against sensuality. Satan will tempt you in every way. However, for every temptation, there is strength to overcome. According to 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will allow, not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will also make the way to, of escape that you may be able to bear it. Christian, did you catch that? God makes it capable for us to escape temptation. We just need to submit to his will and follow what he has told us in his word. We need to fight slothfulness. Romans 12, 11 tells us there, not lagging in diligence, but fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Lagging, slothfulness, 
There is no excuse for laziness in the life of the Christian. Lazy people get into trouble. Idle hands are the devil's workshop. Remember that old saying? Lazy people get in trouble. Satan often works through lazy people. So we need to fight against slothfulness in our own lives. We can't be lazy about our Christian life. We've got to be concerned about it. We've got to be constantly aware of what's going on around us. The last thing, happiness through following. Happiness through following. In Matthew 4, 19, it says this. Then he said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. If we follow God, he will make us what he wants us to be. He wants us all to be fishers of men. Now, some folks are going to be better about fishing than others. I don't know about you, but that was always a challenge for me. I liked to fish, and uh, I, was, I was fairly good at it, you know, but not as good as some of my other kinfolk are. My grandfather was a commercial fisherman in the Mississippi River, and he'd take out these trawler nets that were about 20 feet long that he pulled behind a, a john boat, and he would fill up that net with fish and sold them over, you know, the counter. That was his job. I was listening to an uh, uh, interesting little story about a guy that went down to uh, the bay and was fishing off the side of the bay and was catching, trying to catch some fish, just never could. There was a little boy over here on the other side that was really doing some good, man. He was just pulling them in right and left, right and left. And it was kind of a cool day, and the guy went over to the little boy, and he says, how come you're doing so good? Well, this is a river one. And the guy said, what do you say? <laughs> you got to keep your worms warm. If that makes you a better fisherman, folks, let me tell you something. I'm taking this turno can and putting it over there to warm my worms. <laughs> I'm not going to try to keep it in my back. If we're going to be fishers, we've got to keep our worms warm. <laughs> we've got to know what to look for in a person's life. Don't go beating them on the head with the Bible right off. Get to know them first. Get to know the person. Get to feel what their need is in their life. You know, it doesn't take long for folks to tell you what, where they're hurting. I remember a time when my wife and I had lunch with one of her teachers, and uh, uh, I had never met her in my life. And uh, we were having lunch, and all of a sudden, she just started opening up. I mean, she told me every problem she had in her life. And my wife afterwards says, what is it about you that people tell you these things? You just need to know and be aware that God can work through you and be willing to let him do it because people will tell you where they're hurting. And we need to be ready to help them in that time. We need to follow, and that's, that's why we need to follow God's call, number one, A. B, we need to follow God's command. In Matthew 22, it tells us, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This requires a complete love for God for us to do that. If we're going to love people, we've got to love God first. You can't love people unless you love God. You cannot witness to people unless you have the love of Christ in your life. People can tell when you're a fake. They know. If you're not, that's why Jesus told the disciples one time when they came to him and said, Lord, these father folks out here, they're healing the sick. They're, they're doing all kinds of things. And Jesus said, don't worry about it. He said, if they're of us, then they're not against us. But then he also told them this. He said, there are those that will come to me and say, Lord, Lord, look what we have done in thy name. And I'll tell you that I'll call, not say to them, but I'll say to them, you have not known me. There can be fake folks out there too that do good deeds. But the deed that most has to be done in your life is to know who Jesus Christ is. Without his love, you can't really love the world. I had a, before I was saved, I had a professor of mine at uh, Southwest College in Bolivar, Missouri, did a personality survey on us young pastors. I'm still, I was a minister even then. And uh, after he did the personality survey, he called us all in one by one. I walked into his office and sat down. 
And he looked at me and he says, Howard, why don't you like people? I said, what do you mean? He said, your survey doesn't show that you like people at all. I thought, really? I thought about that for a while. Maybe that's what caused me to be warned again two years later at a church that I was serving in Springfield, Missouri. Because you see, without the love of Christ in my life, I really couldn't love people and put up with them. <laughs> well, I just said, don't go there. <laughs> you got to love people because people are going to be people. You've got to realize that the lost person is not a saved person. And they're not going to think like you, and they're not going to talk like you, and they're not going to act like you. So if you're going to be effective in witnessing, we've got to realize that person's still in the world. They've not gotten into Christ. It's Christ who makes the changeover, folks. We're just supposed to give them the word of how to get changed. We're supposed to uh, point to the changing room, which is on their knees before Jesus. We can't change them. Jesus does. See? We've got to follow God's commission. John 15, as, uh, verse 16 says that, You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. If you study that passage there in John 15 a little further, you'll find that three times he says, You shall do bear fruit. You shall bear fruit. You shall bear more fruit. You shall bear much more fruit. It increases as we witness. A good friend of mine got saved miraculously by his wife in Glenstone Baptist Church. Became a witness at Craft Company. Won 700 people to the Lord in a year's time. I asked him afterwards, I said, what changed you around, Howard? His name was Howard also. And he said, when Jesus got into my heart, I realized that these folks were lost that where I'm working with. And I didn't want to see any of them go to hell. I want them all to go to heaven with me. He began to be one of the greatest witnesses that church ever had. One of the best deacons that church ever had. Why? Jesus changed his life. D, we need to follow God's character. In 1 Peter 1, 16, it says, For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. I think sometimes we forget that the Holy Spirit lives within us. And when we go places and do things, we need to remember that He's right there. He doesn't stop and come out of us when we go into some place we shouldn't go. He's with us. And He follows us and is a part of us all day long. That's the reason he tells us, be careful what you say. Be careful what you do. You are somebody's Bible as a Christian. They're watching you. They're reading your life. And I know sometimes it gets frustrating. I've run into problems of my own self. But I'd like to say a little more than what I wanted to say. And I'd like to give an explanation of a word or so that I don't need normally use. I made up a fake language. My folks don't know this, but that I made up a fake language, and they think I'm talking Indian, but sometimes I'm not talking Indian. It does affect us, and it affects others around us. A good friend of mine, a pastor uh, up and around uh, Yellville, Arkansas, him and I did a lot of things together. We went on mission trips together, and he, we were putting a roof on the church one day, and all of a sudden, he hit his thumb with his hammer. And I could hear him say, glory. I looked at him and I said, why did you say glory? He said, it's better than what I thought. And sometimes we have to change our wording in situations like that. Because you never know who's listening. As we were on top of the church and there had been a lot of people walking around the church watching us do what we were doing. And I told him afterwards, I said, thank you. That gives me a word I can say when I need to hit them, I thumb too. <laughs> Happiness comes with salvation. This year, if you're going to start it off right, you need to know Jesus. We must remain and continue to maintain 
happiness. I know it's tough. We were leaving this morning, and all three of our dogs were laying on their beds with those sad eyes. We call it the mully grubs, because they knew we were leaving. It's that separation anxiety. But I see a lot of Christians that way. We don't need to be sad. We need to be glad. If you've got Jesus Christ in your heart, you ought to be expressing that. And yes, there are going to be troubles that come along. But if you can maintain your happiness through those times of trouble, you'll see people start asking you, how come you can deal with things like that? And that's an opening, folks. Tell them about Jesus. How can we keep this happiness? Well, number one, read the Bible daily. Be in God's Word. Number two, take time to pray daily. Man, don't start your day without prayer. I know sometimes we have family devotions in our house, and sometimes we'll have our prayer, and there'll be times when we think, man, what do we pray for? Well, you better pray for everything to go right that day, and that God will give you the strength when it goes wrong. Take time to pray. Always think the best of all people. Now, I know that's a tough one. But folks, let me tell you something. We are sinners saved by grace. If it weren't for Jesus, we'd be in the same condition of a lot of those folks out there. So we need to think the best of all people. Give them a chance. Give them an opportunity. Somebody asked how we had our, our Christmas was. It was great. You ready for this? We had guests. One of them was a flaming homosexual, and one was a drag queen. And we sat and had a ball. I was thinking as I, this was going on, isn't this what Jesus told the disciples? Isn't this what he told the Pharisees when they said, he is eating with sinners? And he came to save sinners, the lost, not the saved. We need to be open to anyone God sends our way. And this church needs to be open to anyone God sends its way. We now not, may not agree with their lifestyles, but let me tell you something. There isn't a family in here that hasn't been affected by the different lifestyles. We need to have a heart to allow them to be a part of opportunities for us to share the faith. Did anything happen? We don't know. Because we're not told to change them. We're told to share the word. We've got to be open we don't have to accept the way they're living. That's their choice. But what we do have to accept is the opportunity that God gives us to share the faith. Always look on the good side of life. I don't know about you, but Monday is not a good day for me. Did you know that more pastors resign on Monday than any other day? Somebody asked one of them why, the, why that was so. He said, did you ever try to preach to the dead on Sunday? Truth is, what do we expect when we come to the Lord's house? We need to expect God to be there for us and to give us a word. Lastly, we need to accept everything that comes into our life as a gift from God. That may be tough to do. But let me tell you something. It'll change your life. It'll change your year. God allows things to happen for a reason. And that reason is to shape us into the character and the life that he wants us to have. And it gives us the opportunity to be a witness for him. So if we want to see 2023 be better than 2022, we need to accept the challenge. As Corinthians said, you have opened before me a door, but there are many adversaries. Be aware of what we're up to uh, against but also realize that we're not alone in the endeavor. Jesus is with us. Jesus said, with me, you can do all things. Without me, you can do nothing. What about you today? How do you want to start your year? Do you want to start it with possibilities? Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If you do, praise God. Get ready. I believe we're about to see three to four years of challenges. 
And those challenges are going to test our mettle and our faith. And we better be ready. So maybe you need to settle something with the Lord. That's what these altars are here for. Maybe you need to be a part of a believing church. If you're not now, you need to be. Because fellowship is going to be vitally to make through the power of the Holy Spirit today. You come. As we stand and as we sing, won't you come? Thanks for joining us here today. We hope that you enjoyed the message and it made it impact in your life. Hey, you want to make sure and visit with us on the web at mycmbc.us. Also, be sure to stop by our Facebook page and follow the ministry of Crow Mountain Baptist Church. You can find it at facebook.com forward slash Crow Mountain Baptist. Tune in next week for another amazing message. Have a great week.